Hey guys, thank you for tuning in to episode 15 of the Whips Nation podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and our guest today is Whip Snakes goalie, Brian Phipps. Brian talks to us about how he started playing lacrosse, his time at Maryland, and transitioning into coaching. Uh, I even drop a massive update, so please make sure you listen to the very end. You already know it's going to be a good one, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. Don't run away, run away, run away. Don't run away, run away. Run! Up on the mountain, I see down below. It's easy to lose yourself, I know. Can't hear what you're shouting, I'm deaf to your show. It's easy to lose your self-control. Everybody gets high, everybody gets low. Special thanks to Jake Pomeroy for the new intro music. You guys can check out his band, For the Better, on Apple Music or Spotify and check out their website, ForTheBetterBand.com, for show dates. All right. Thank you, Brian, for uh, coming on the podcast. We're really excited to, uh, to have you. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Brian Phipps uh, was from Annapolis, Maryland, uh, played at Severn High School, was a four-year starter at the University of Maryland, uh, ACC Freshman of the Year, uh, 2010 Captain, All-ACC, All-American, the 2010 UMD Male Athlete of the Year. That's uh, quite the, uh, the award there. Um, first ever full-time director of lacrosse ops at UMD and assistant coach. Uh, assistant coach at Georgetown from 2012 to 2014, and has been the head coach of uh, Archbishop Spalding since uh, 2014, and uh, won a 2019 MLL championship, and is a uh, current goalie for the Whip Snakes Lacrosse Club. Brian Phipps. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm excited to talk it up. Yeah, All no, right. absolutely. Uh, Brian is uh, <laughs> is currently um, in Salt Lake City. We're going to be playing the Atlas tomorrow at this time so at the time that we're recording so yeah happy to have him yeah yeah made it made it out here safely so easy easy flight so got all settled in our hotel room got practicing a little bit so we're excited to get going perfect so brian we like to start with some rapid fire questions um the first question is what is the biggest or toughest animal that you think you could legitimately beat in a fight oh uh I don't know. I don't really like my chances against many animals, but um, uh, I'd go with a cat. A cat. <laughs> I think you should give yourself a little more credit than that. Um, what would you rather have? A PLL championship, an NCAA championship, or an MIAA championship, but as the head coach? Oof. Uh, that, that's pretty tough. I think last year was a uh, I mean, I've, I've lost in all three of those championships, so it's kind of a, <laughs> uh, a tough Which one hurt the most? <laughs> yeah. um, I think, you know, kind of in the swing of things to, to end my career in the, or to coming to the end of my career in the PLL, champ, in the PLL I think that would be great. Getting a, a championship there would be a nice way to kind of put a put a ending ending chapter to my PLL career. But sure. uh the, the MIA championship for Spalding would be something that I'd be very proud of in terms of where we were and where we came. And uh, losing in in the uh, 2021 championship was tough. Yeah. Uh, getting it back to the playoffs this year. So hopefully we can kind of continue to compete at the highest level there for Spalding. But uh, you know, it's, it's never tough to lose in championship games, but you also have to appreciate getting there as well. For sure. Um, lamb chops, Thanksgiving turkey, or crab cakes? Oh, uh, that's actually a really tough one because I was born on Thanksgiving. Oh, okay. Obviously, Maryland crab cakes are, are um, you know, local for, for us in Annapolis. But I love lamb chops. So I think I would probably go, like, lamb chops as the as the number one because it's more of a specialty rather than sure. the crab cakes we're having I have pretty frequently. Sure. And, and, <laughs> Then the turkey is overrated. That's the most overrated part of Thanksgiving dinner. So mm. okay, okay, just throwing that out there. <laughs> What's the least overrated part of Thanksgiving dinner? Uh, I'm a huge green bean casserole guy, actually, oh, yeah. and, and stuffing. So yeah, both of those are my two favorites. As long as it's got the crispy onions, those oh, green absolutely. bean casserole, that's where it's all at. Yeah, onions on top. Yeah, 
Yeah. And then the final rapid fire question, would you rather score a game winning full field goal or make a game ending save? Uh, I think probably a game ending save just because it's more, um, you're not supposed, I guess the game winning full field goal would be <laughs> never really both, both tough. Yeah. Yeah. I never really fathom that one. So, um, the, the game winning save is one that would probably be more sentimental to me and me more coming from our goalie position sure. rather than scoring the, the goal. I don't know how that would feel. Sure. Awesome. And um, kind of speaking of making crazy lacrosse plays, like what kind of got you into lacrosse? Like how did you find out about it? I mean, obviously growing up in Maryland, it's uh, you know it's probably easier to get into lacrosse than you know being raised out west. But how did, uh, how did you find the game or how did the game find you? Yeah, I think I was born into it pretty much. Um, both my parents played. My grandfather played at Maryland. My grandfather coached at Navy um, and won like eight or nine national championships at Navy as an assistant. So um, oh, kind of been, been just thrown into the lacrosse when I was born. So uh, playing at a very young age, playing all different positions, um, and then just kind of finalizing goalie position as a freshman in high school. Um, it's kind of when I just kind of focused on that mostly, but – um, just being a, a student of the sport, my dad coached my brother growing up, so I was always the water boy and, and following him around to all his tournaments and games and so forth. So um, I think I was just kind of engulfed by the sport and not forced to play lacrosse, but definitely right. uh, led down that path for, at an early age. Did you, like, yeah. start playing goalie? Like, how did how did you find goalie? Like, were they – like uh, no one else wanted to play it, so Brian's like, "Hey, you know, I'll step up." Like, how did how did you start playing goalie? Like after, so like I guess like the age limits was like clinic was like the earliest we played, and then moved to midget level, and then pee wee level, um, or pee wee then midget then juniors. But um, after our clinic level, our, our goalie moved up to the next age bracket, so we didn't have one. So my buddy and I decided to play. Like I'll play a half of attack, half goalie, <laughs> half attack, half midi. And kind of did that for about four or five years. And then, you know, in middle school, I started becoming more of a goalie. But I would play attack for some teams or, or every now and then. And then kind of my, my fresh going into my freshman year, my dad was like, you got to decide, like, which one you're going to do and start focusing on that more. And you're not very fast, so I'd recommend playing goalie. <laughs> yeah. I got it. Um, nice. So I kind of want to stay in the same kind of line of questions about you know, being a goalie. So like in, in baseball, it's kind of like, um, um, it's like a faux pas that like a lot of catchers end up, end up becoming managers. Um, they kind of see the field in a different way than everybody else. Do you feel like being a goalie, it's kind of a similar situation for you? Like, do you feel like you see the whole field, like you see the field a little differently than everybody else? Yeah, definitely. I think and I, even if my, you know, being a head coach now, having to coach offense and coach defense and oversee riding and clearing all that aspects you know a goal is pretty much part of every single aspect of that because you know we have to instruct our defense what to do in regards to what offenses are doing so you see what offenses work what don't work kind of how you can cat and mouse play your games that way so i definitely think a goalie sees everything obviously you're the the seventh man on defense or you're the one directing traffic and have a great viewpoint of of the whole field so it's a yeah. great view of, of a catcher uh, the goalie. Was there was there one specific topic that when you became a head coach that we kind of struggled to 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 teach because you were you know not a field player you know was there anything that you you kind of struggled with at the beginning? I'll be completely honest with you. I probably know not much at all about facing off. So that's sure. the one. I'm like, all right, I need to hire somebody. I need help there. Who can right. come and and support me and, and kind of take that over and and go from there because. That's the one aspect that I don't know much about. I think I can understand like wing play and how to do that aspect of it, but the initial odds of facing off and the tactics and schematics in that way, I'm, it's kind of way over my head. Yeah, and it changes all the time too. Yeah, yeah seriously. Rules I felt like <laughs> I finally felt like I had a good grip of it uh, with the knee down, and then they switched to stand up neutral, and I was like, all right, well, it's like I've got to completely relearn this now. Yeah. All the rules in lacrosse. It's so crazy. Did you guys play with the shot clock this year for high school? Yes, we play college rules, so we really? play all CLA rules, which is nice. Um, and it helps our kids get acclimated to, to that next level. And yeah, I was going to say, did they like it? 
Yeah, they love it. Yeah. So it's hard. We'll play some teams from out of state that don't play the shot clock, and it's poof, it's, it's a totally different game. And <laughs> to get used to just kind of scaling it all back and, and whatnot. Yeah, no more four minute possessions. <laughs> yeah, I watched one of those U twenty one World Games yesterday, and you know the the field is wider, and there's no twenty to get it over. And yeah. so it's just like, man, this is they just have unlimited time, and it's there's so much space. It's like it's just a you know different version, but you know it's still been fun to watch. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I know Max and I talk about it all the time, like what is like the best like version of lacrosse? Because now there's like there's like four or five. You know, and the PLL to me is probably like the most like entertaining. I think it's a really yeah. like good mix and blend of okay, there's a shot clock. It's a little bit shorter of a field. It's faster paced. Um, there's a two point line. Like I have a really hot take with a lot of people that I think it's a, a an iteration of like a two point line should like progress just like the NBA would with basketball through levels of lacrosse down through high school so like once you get high school there's a two-point line you know um what, what's your take on that uh, that makes makes a lot of sense um i think um just getting a two-point line in general would help um and start that process with it um i just think it makes the game a little more exciting and, and yeah just, our, our the game has evolved so much like just like basketball didn't have a two-point line before yeah. certain years and then all of a sudden they adapted to it so i think it just it, it kind of and, and we're very similar to basketball and, and, and yeah. sport play so fast breaks transition all that good stuff so um i just think it makes the most sense and again you know trying to make it as appeasing and, and appealing to the audience i think that two point is very exciting as a goalie it's not that great but on the other <laughs> side of things yeah and with like shooters like you know mike chan and chuck who can consistently hit twos and it'll give you know, guys like Earhart, you know, a larger role in transition offense to contribute, you know, two point. And then my other biggest point is it adds tension to, you know, two point games with less than a minute left. You know what I mean? Or one less point than, games. Yeah. Or even one point games. Yeah. Like, what do you do? Absolutely. Do you go for the win or do you go for a tie? You know, it kind of adds right. like another layer of strategy from a coaching perspective. Hey. I bet they love our games since we're always one point one goal games. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hate your games because uh, I'm. It, I swear I've lost like ten years of my life watching Whip Snakes yeah. lacrosse games. <laughs> it's trust me, we feel the same way sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, uh, Max Schmidt is a mutual friend of ours. I, I coach with him in Vegas. He's a buddy of mine. Um, and I, I texted him earlier today and said, you know, Hey, give me some stories about, about Brian. And he said, uh, he said you were kind of a legend when it came to dressing up for theme parties. So are there any particular theme parties that kind of stick out in your mind or in your memory? I just, I, I just love like Halloween. I get all into the Halloween. <laughs> That's what he said. Yeah. He said you'd love yeah, Halloween. So, yeah. And now like with my wife, adding characters into our, into my Halloween costumes with my wife and now my daughter, you know, it's just adds that excitement or do like a big arts and crafts build up for the week rather than I don't buy I'm, I'm not a store-bought guy where I you know buy the costume off the shelf and put it on you know so I'm um, big into arts and crafts and doing that in terms of our theme parties in college we got into it pretty good too with with some uh some of uh, the throwback parties and Harley Harley gnarly parties etc so oh yeah, uh, yeah the, the, the uh the Halloween is definitely kind of my holiday that I try to try to own in terms of the, the costumes is there any other uh like guy like fellow turps that could match your uh your skills with the uh, the costumes or no uh brian farrell who was a classmate of my roommate and also the head coach at boys latin um he was just as he was on par for, for the really? holiday. so we <laughs> uh made it a big deal to, to kind of go all out rather than buy the costume so nice. uh, he still continues to he's got a daughter as well and so they continue to do fun costumes that we'll compete against and kind of get our friends to vote on to see who, who, who pulled it on. That's awesome. How far in advance do you typically plan these things out? Um, I already have our, I mean, it's, okay. I have a list of ones that I want to do already and then okay. kind of go from there to see if anything pops up or, or any new kind of dis- So big Disney theme movie guy for the past mm. couple of years in terms of dressing up. So, um, like the Lion King came out recently, a couple years ago, and we did that, um, that new animated one. So that was like the hot topic. And then yeah, yeah. the Beauty and the Beast, when that came out, that was a hot topic. And, and I try not to do like the main characters we do. Like, uh, we were, you know, Cogsworth and 
and the candlestick and nice that stuff. So it was, it was uh, it's fun to do that. And now with my daughter, it's going to be more fun to see her kind of grow. But I'm assuming when she gets old enough, it's going to be what does she want to do? And then we got to, she'll be in charge shortly. Right. That's, that's crazy. And congratulations, by the way. I know like that's a, that's a pretty recent thing. How old is uh, your daughter? She just turned one last week. Wow. So it's been a fun, fun, fun year. Um, so far, so good. So we're getting, we're getting through, but the, uh, the away trips are tough to, to leave the family and, and the daughter, but uh, sometimes it's nice to catch up on some sleep and relax. Yeah, yeah no, I can I can imagine. Um, this is going to be like a total like bombshell probably, uh, but I found out today that I'm going to be having a daughter, so. Oh, wow. That's yeah, awesome. no, nobody knows yet. So like when this episode releases, like it'll be kind of coming around, but I was looking forward to talking to you because I know you were going through you know, something yeah. similar and looking at Max's face right now, like obviously he didn't know either. So, um, a, yeah, my wife is, uh, is 12 weeks pregnant. We found out wow. today that we're going to have a daughter. So, um, Max, when we were at the bar, like a couple, you know, weeks ago and you're asking why Megan wasn't having a beer and now, you know, so yeah, uh, usually there's like a little, Oh, how come you're not having a beer? It's like, yeah, yeah, I, ex- I have exactly. an idea. Yeah. Part of like trying to hide it, but still be social, but also, oh, right. I know it's like, yeah. and it's, and it's like really like 12 weeks until, you know, the tests come back and everything's healthy and yeah. everything. And they're like, OK, yeah, you could start, you know, telling your friends and family and everybody. And so, you know, we had told some folks, uh, you know, before that, like immediate family and everything. But now that it's everything's good, it's open. And yeah, so now just thinking about names and uh, paint colors and all that. And yeah. So, and it, so if you were to come up with one piece of advice for a new uh, new dad, um, what do you got for me? Uh, I would read up on some books and, and listen okay. to your wife's advice. <laughs> she's never, <laughs> wrong, so, um, she's, she's definitely going to be the one going through the most. So be there, be supportive and, and kind of, you're going to start taking a back seat now and, and kind of doing things that she wants to do and, and whatnot. So, uh, it's been fun and, and obviously it'd be a great ride. And, and once that, that day comes when, when, uh, when she's born it's gonna be life-changing but it's gonna yeah. be surreal. soak it all in <laughs> yeah late february is uh is kind of the date that we're looking at so all right but yeah, alex I, told me that he had a secret question that he didn't want to put in the, in our in our prep notes in our show so notes, now, yeah. I, now i know i was like you know you sure you don't want to write it down he's like no i think i'm good <laughs> no i think i'm good um yeah. but so yeah leaving a family is is definitely hard i know i had a job where i had to travel quite a bit and that's always tough um with coaching especially like i know even now like i spend a lot of time you know at practices coaching both max and i coach at a pinnacle high school here in arizona and uh so yeah if, if, if you and the spalding guys are ever looking to come out west and get out of the get out of the weather you know we could set something up but uh how did you get into coaching after uh after graduating um so i went when I went to college, I, I studied history and was thinking of being like a high school teacher and coach, which eventually I, I did. And then um, after graduating, uh, Coach Cottle uh, was done coaching and Coach Tillman came on, came on staff. Um, and he asked me to help kind of be on staff, coach, and help the transition um, with the roster. Um, so I started coaching right away in college for four or five years. And then um, – my wife coaches at Maryland as well. So oh. kind of coaching in college was a little, a little tough in terms of not seeing each other on weekends and traveling. And if I looked at another job, it'd be out of state and I didn't want to move and tough to kind of keep working up the ranks um, and having to travel so much. So um, I moved to, we <clears throat> moved back to Annapolis and started coaching and teaching at Spalding. And she's been at Maryland for the past, you know, eight or nine, nine years now. So wow, uh, it's, been, it's been working well. Yeah, no, absolutely. What's your, what's your like favorite aspect of coaching versus playing, you know, cause you're still an active player. So I'm sure it's, yes. you know, fun to kind of, you know, bounce between those two hats. Like what's your favorite part about coaching? The best part about it is like the relationships they develop with the players and seeing yeah. them grow and um, seeing a freshman mature all the way through and, and graduate. And now playing at the college level is very exciting. And we've turned out some pretty good lacrosse players recently that, that are going to be playing, you know, high level division one lacrosse it'll be fun to to watch them play um and so forth but the relationships that you build off the field and i think that's one thing that you know the maryland guys develop very well and obviously the whip snakes kind of carry that on too is like the relationships that we have on and off the field 
you know, to contribute to us having success on the field. I think that as a player, a coach, whatever it might be, yeah. uh, and getting that comfort level between you, the, the players and the coaches, and you're going to play your best when you're comfortable and having fun, and that's what we're all about. Yeah. Have you yeah. played against any of your former players? Um, well, I coached a lot of these whip snakes at Maryland, so uh, <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't count that, but I have right. not played against any um, of my current high school players. I've played against current, like, uh, Brian Costavio, I, I coached against him when he was at Mount St. Joe. Mm. Um, I coached against Matt Reese when he was at Boys Latin. So a lot of guys that I coached against in mm. the, um, I coached against Logan Wisnowski when he was at Boys Latin. So a lot of kids that I coached against, uh, and against now, uh, yeah. but, um, we got some kids that are going off to college right now that we freshmen that have a chance to probably play in the PLO down the road, maybe. Um, but I don't know if I got four years in me to, to see <laughs> <laughs> come to fruition so yeah um from the outside kind of sticking to that same topic um you know with the small rosters um i know i know uh, coach stagnita just gave a an interview with quinn kesnick and was um talking about advocating for larger rosters also small coaching staffs uh, but i think one of the more interesting things about uh the pll is how many of those guys are also coaches like a, like it seems like most of them if not all of them coach in some capacity do you like from the outside i really get the impression that you're kind of a player coach like that throwback like pete rose style like you know player coach do you feel like you kind of take that responsibility on or are, are there other guys that you feel like kind of fill that role yeah i mean i think um kind of being the the veteran guy and and having coached some of these players already at maryland and, and just being in the league for a long time or are playing and, and developing that relationship last year again with coach Stagnita and, and gaining his trust. And I think, you know, it's something that him and I talked about in the off season is, is being helpful where I can, um, whether it's coaching the box, running the box and substitution stuff, or, or giving some insight here and there, um, offensively, defensively, whatever, whatever might be, um, sure. to use us as, as our assets, just like, you know, Mike Chan and Chuck can talk some offense with coach Stags every, every time he's out there, you know, Kyle Burn Lord is now coaching, uh, at, at his new high school, I'm saying, uh, saying Xavier, I believe, um, St. Ignatius. Um, so it's the guys are out there that have that same mindset of kind of doing whatever it takes to help the team and using your lacrosse sense, because let's be honest, we're all playing this league because we love lacrosse so much. Yeah. And we're trying to do whatever we can with lacrosse. So a lot of that ends up being on the coaching side as well, but you know, in the, in the long run, I'll probably hopefully end up on the sideline, the PLL coaching eventually one day. Um, but you know, as Kyle's playing really well and, and helping us be successful, I'm trying to help us be successful in other ways uh, when I'm not out there on the field. That's awesome. Yeah, it's um, a great answer. No, absolutely. Uh, I have a fun like hypothetical question. So as everyone knows, you know the PLL is a tour-based model right now. You guys go from city to city. Um, if the PLL switched to city-based next year, where would the eight teams be based? Um, I, I would have to imagine the Redwoods would be like the West Coast California team. Yeah. In terms of the, the name. The mascot the, and everything, yeah. Mascot. Like Redwoods are like Northern California, Southern yeah, Oregon California. type of, yeah. 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 So um, that would be there. I mean, I think like the Washington Whip Snakes makes sense. Um, being close to College Park and in the Mid-Atlantic region um, is something that I would think. I think like the chaos would be either – Canada team can like, yeah like Toronto yeah. or something or upstate or yeah. Buffalo makes sense with the yeah, yeah. Sure. or Roch or something yeah, yeah I yeah. think like the the Chrome scream Rochester to me just because of mm. or upstate because of the connections of the Rattlers that they had when they first came over and Coach Sudan but, but their colors scream Miami Brian yeah they do <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> right like very true yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I'm curious. Like, I think the Atlas and the Bulls could be like Texas. You know, yeah, I'm just, sure. Like, just kind of throwing those out there and, and kind of seeing where it fits. Obviously, the Cannons would go back to Boston. Yeah, of course. River, hopefully, um, to keep that that namesake. But um, it's exciting to think about that. You know, yeah. kind of what what could be next for the PO. I think we're gaining a lot of positive steam right now, um, and seeing where we go next is something that I'm excited about. I'm happy to be part of. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, um, I, 
think both Paul and Mike have come out saying it's a matter of you know when, not if. You know, the PLL eventually goes city based, um, and it comes down to like a number of teams in the league and logistics. Like you're in a hotel right now. Imagine if they're in all the teams. Correct me if I'm wrong. Are in the same hotel from city to city. So if you increase that number of teams to you know 12, imagine logistics of getting 12 teams with you know 20 guys and coaching staffs and everything in hotels and uh, getting field space like that becomes like a really hard thing to thing to manage. I think that number is probably about 12 teams is probably like the absolute limit. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if that's that's kind of where your head's at too. Yeah. I'm not sure what, what would happen, whether we go city-based, do we play, you know, each home game at your own time, or, like, does Washington get one weekend, does Boston yeah. get one weekend, and still, like, kind of a, yeah. be able to go to those games, I don't know, but, again, it's exciting to see, and, and what Paul and Mike have done, you know, in the past six years now, or five years, whatever it's been, kind of building this thing up has been pretty impressive, so I kind of trust those in, in charge to to keep us in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. See, I'd like to see, I'd like to see, I got, I have kind of a hot take on this actually. Um, I'd like to see teams have maybe two plays, two homes. So that way more, cause I know that they want to get across in kind of non-traditional places, Minnesota, the West coast, you know, Minnesota, going was, to, best week. Minnesota was an awesome. Yeah. Week. It yeah. looked awesome. Yeah. But I mean, I know that, <laughs> don't let I know hear that, that. <laughs> tech, yeah, I know. Don't let, don't let Leo hear that. Um, you know, but I know that, you know, Texas has a, has a growing lacrosse scene and, and then Pacific Northwest has a growing lacrosse scene in Southern California. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I'd like to see if not, a, a, you know, a split, uh, you know, like maybe two homes, but maybe just do like a hybrid model, maybe like two thirds of the games are at a, are at your uh, home. Uh, and then maybe just do a couple of weeks where mm -hmm. all the teams go to, you know, you know, yeah. find a way to get into those markets because, you know, I think that was one of the, the one of the issues with the MLL was outside of those areas, not that, you know, not as many people were watching. And the PLL has done a really good job of trying to reach more markets. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd like to see them continue to do that, be creative with ways to go, go play in Minnesota, go play in Seattle, go play in Salt Lake. Yeah, for sure. I, I think it's something that they've done a nice job of, of, like you said, being in these new markets. And it's cool for us to play and, and, yeah. and travel. Well, and I think I think Max is right. I think it's a hybrid thing that they need to go to. I don't know that they need to go full traditional city base because obviously like that model might work. It might not. But having like a hybrid thing like uh, like I know the NFL has been like testing the waters and having like games held in London and Mexico City and things like that. If the PLL did something very similar where they, you know, make a destination weekend, you know, every week where they pick two teams and they meet you know, in a neutral site, like, yeah. I think that would be something very cool. And logistically setting up travel for two teams is nothing compared to the eight that they're doing now. So yeah, I can. Yep, for sure. That'd be very cool. Well, um, Brian, I want to ask one final question. Give us a preview. Uh, when this comes out, you guys, uh, I'm going to try to get this out tomorrow when you guys play Atlas. So give us a preview of that game and, uh, how are we going to do? I think, I mean, I think it's to the top, teams in the league obviously yeah. with standings and talent wise um i think we played our best game of the year against them out in new york so hopefully we can kind of uh replicate that, that that same performance um with joe playing as well as he is at the face off x kind of hopefully can can go head to toe with with baptiste and and if we go 50 50 there then i like our chances for sure with kyle and that and, and the way our offense has been playing and defensively so i like our chances you know i don't know the the betting spreads are yet for the schemes, but uh, it's probably going to be a one goal game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be real. Yeah. But, uh, but hopefully uh, we end up on top and clinch the one seed going out. Beautiful. Well, thanks, Brian. I appreciate you coming on, brother. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Hey, I told you guys it was going to be a good episode. Hey, if you enjoyed that episode today, please leave a like if you're on YouTube and uh, you know follow us on Spotify and if you have a buddy who's also a Whip Snakes fan, uh, maybe uh, share the link, you know, share the love. Uh, hopefully we'll be uh, recording another episode soon, and I'll uh, catch you guys next time. Peace. Peace.